uh, the coma hasn't hit since Jan's done, and now it's my turn. Uh, you got to see uh, in Jan's presentation some great pictures of connectivity, but I think it was probably pretty clear that flow has something to do with it too. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about ecological flows. And this is essentially looking at the relationship between flow and the abundance of, of given species of fish that can be supported at any given flow. And, and I think you can tell that, you know, from a management perspective, this is really important if you are charged with diverting water or say you want to pull out a dam and you want to kind of figure out what the flows are going to be like after the fact. Uh, and so I, I've, I've spoken about this before with regard to uh, brook trout, uh, a little bit on brown trout, so some of you may have seen this before. But the, the basic, really simple model that we use is just the cumulative abundance of fish that is supported by any given flow or those less than that. And you get this S-shaped curve. Okay, so this is, this is pretty common. I'll see if I can use my, my pointer here. You see the S-shaped curve. As you turn the flow up, you get to a point out here where there's enough flow to support all possible you know, fish or populations in a region. And that's optimal, right? That's, that's great. You may have extra water. You could divert from there and probably not affect the fish very much. But as you turn the spigot down, you very rapidly lose some of your populations or some of your abundance in a given stream. And you'll get to a point where you know, you've got nothing left. Right? Uh, of course, dewatered is bad. Um, so one of the things we have, uh, we've done is, is, is a, uh, fit these models. They're empirical. Uh, to the data available for brook trout. We haven't done it in a migratory species like walleye before, so that's what I'm going to use as my example today. The other thing we haven't done is look at seasons. Okay, and there are seasonal differences uh, in the shapes of these curves. Well, I shouldn't say it. The basic shape is the same, but it's kind of the, the uh, characteristics of where the uh, high change areas are and the low change areas are uh, are different for different uh, uh, different stream types, for different species, for different seasons. All variety of things. So we fit these models where we have the data for different loading types. And the types, the classes that we have are a combination of thermal regime and size. And this uh, figure here shows you uh, the distribution of different size streams in the Great Lakes Basin. And I've highlighted in uh, the thicker orange there large warm rivers. And I do that because the only data we have that's sufficient to fit these models for walleye are large warm rivers. If we had data for small rivers or you know, cooler situations, we would have different, different graphs uh, to, to explain this relationship. So again, here's what they look like. And uh, we fit a model here for uh, brook trout in the summer, and then in the upper left is the brook trout for the spring. And um, I want you to notice the, the scale and the <coughs> axis on the bottom. Okay, the x-axis is yield. Okay, yield is basically flow divided by the area drained. So it gives us a standardized flow. Um, and at this point, I want to make an appeal to all my colleagues to use metric, because that's the right way to do it. It's really simpler. And then having said that, I'm going to be a total hypocrite. I'm going to talk about it in English units. Because yield units uh, uh, in English are more digestible. They have a smaller range. And I think most of the folks in here who deal with flows are probably going to think in terms of that. So I'm going to. I'm going to backpedal and talk about it in English units anyway. Um, so what you'll see here, in the summer, uh, walleye uh, flows that we have data for go up to about 1.4, and these are cubic feet per second per square mile. That's the yield part, right? In the spring, it goes high as six. So this is quite a bit more water to deal with. And uh, for management purposes, you know, uh, this is, been divided up into uh, sections of flow that support an optimal number of fish, uh, stressed areas in the yellow where we're starting to drop off, uh, we're starting to lose some of our fish as the population or as the uh, as the yield goes down and fewer are supported. The critical zone is right at the uh, inflection point of these curves where for any unit of change in the yield, you're going to get the greatest change in the population of, of the fish. Okay. Now, these are, as I said, they're pretty simple models, but they're not all that easy to use if you're a manager and you're going to sit down and try to figure out, well, let's see, my stream is at this flow, and I think I want to take out this much water. You know, what is that going to do to where I'm going to have a decrease or an increase in the fish? And so 
in order to help with this, I have uh, written a computer program that is going to um, help someone play those what-if games. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, all I'm doing here uh, is highlighting those sensitivity areas, right? We had green was optimal, and yellow was stressed, and red is critical. Throughout the Great Lakes Basin, this is what we have for large warm rivers with regard to walleye. And you'll see uh, the Black River highlighted there. We're going to take an example from that in a moment. But this is what the interface, the user interface for the program looks like. Uh, and it's very simple. It'll come up as a single window. And what you do is you select your fish that you want to look at. And we only have four to choose from so far. Uh, and then you decide what kind of system you want, if it's uh, larger rivers or small cold stream or whatever it may be. Uh, and then whether it's summer or, or um, excuse me, spring. Um, and when you enter a value to start your yield, wherever you want to begin is your reference point, and hit the proceed button, you'll get uh, a line reacting on this curve over here. The figure in the graph shows you the general structure of the model, and the blue line tells you where you are as far as what your abundance is that's going to be supported by that yield. The box in the upper left underneath the title gives you a summary of the proportion of all possible walleye that can be supported that is being supported by that given yield, and then what the change is in the yield and what the change is in the fish. Um, and all you do to make this work is you move the slider that's uh, designated there as user control field so uh, flow selector. So here's the challenge with the technology. I'm going to pop that here for a second and see if I can get it to cooperate and demonstrate how this actually works. Okay, so there's the program. <coughs> I'm going to select walleye, and I'm going to leave it at summer uh, in the English units for a large warm river. That's my only choice because that's the only data we have. And right here, I'm going to start with one. Uh, and the reason is we need some place to begin. I'm going to show you an example. I, I should have gone to another slide, but in a section of the Black River, for example, where there's lots of uh, walleye, the yield is about one in the summertime. And so when we hit the proceed button, uh, you will see, let me get to it, sorry. Okay, you'll see that uh, in the box on the upper left, we're supporting 90.92% of the walleye that could be there. The flow is great. The blue line is very high on the curve. And so, you know, this is a good situation where we're in the optimal zone. Now, if, let's say, for example, we have someone who's requested uh, half a CFS per square meter of yield to use as irrigation or for some industrial purpose. We can take our slider and just slide it down here until we get to 0.5, which will show up as 500 here, or as close as I get it. And you'll see that now, uh, again, in that box in the upper left, uh, we're down to 51% of what we could support in that system if we remove that half of the, half a uh, CFS per square mile yield, and we have been reduced, we reduced the population down about 39% from what it was. Okay, so uh, the same game can be played if you raise it up to one and a half, which would be a half above. And you see that the line just about pegged at the top, we're now supporting 99% of the of the walleye that could be supported there. So, you know, the point is with these curves is you can gain or you can lose, but depending where you are on the curve, your, your gains may be very small in some ways or your losses can be very great. And vice versa, depending on where you start. If we reset this and then we uh, again select walleye but pick the spring, we're going to see, let's see if I start here at four and a half. See, uh, you'll see your curves about in the middle. So this is a spring example where we have a lot more flow, and if our reference point is in the middle, we're, we're supporting about 60% of the fish. Uh, but again, if we drop only a half, another half, even though we have such a wide range of flow here, down to about four, uh, we're going to, uh, again, lose about 38 30, almost 39% of uh, the fish that we had, and we're down to only a quarter of what could be. 
So I think you see how you can get, you can play these what if games with this kind of a tool, and it's you know designed to make uh, life a little bit easier for the folks who have these decisions to make about well, if I have a dam coming out, you know what is that going to be like uh, after we have removed it. So let me hop back to the presentation again. Move on. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is what I was going to show you earlier as a starting point. How do you know where to begin? Well, you can pick any reference you want. It's a, it's a uh, modeling game, so, so to speak. But uh, this section of the Black River outside of Carthage uh, has a, a yield of pretty close to one. So that's why I picked that one. There. So if you're a manager, you can use what you know about the specifics in an area to examine what is going to happen or what might, might happen in that uh, part of the stream. All right, so I'm going to zip through the, these next slides really fast because I, the program worked and I got to show you all the good stuff that it could do. But keep an eye on the blue line and you'll see it go up and down as we uh, go to the different scenarios. Okay, so with regard to walleye, by uh, using these models, and uh, it was actually pretty fast to get some of these quantities, uh, we were able to determine that in the summer, the most rapid rate of change in large warm rivers for walleye populations occurs at about a half a CFS per square meter. The optimal conditions are over about one. And uh, you get down into very poor conditions when you get below about 0.29 CFS per square meter, which would only support about a third or 30 percent of the population. In the spring, the most rapid change occurred at four as opposed to a half. And so there's quite a big scale difference in the flows and yields that we're talking about here by season. But the basic shape of the curve and the response is very similar. Uh, optimal conditions in that case are over five CFS per square mile, and poor conditions are down around three and a half or lower. Uh, and that would only support about 10 or 11 percent of the population. Uh, now, there's a lot of caveats with this. Remember, we're talking about models. <clears throat> so these are empirical, and uh, they therefore depend specifically on the data. Uh, and I'm going I'm to force you to, to bear with me while I back up a moment to one of these examples here. <clears throat> so first things first, uh, models are better with more data, right? Uh, the summer had about 350 points on which we could fit this uh, curve and get a, a responsive model. The spring only had about 103 or 104, I think it was. Uh, for any of you who have worked in, let's say, the Black River in the spring when the flows are up, it's really difficult to sample at that time of year. It's really tough getting the gillnet to stay where you want it to. I don't know if Roger's here or not, but he can tell you. Uh, so, you know, the sampling effort is, is uh, restricted in some ways uh, based on what the conditions are like. And so the data, the amount of data matter. The other thing to notice is that these are fitted lines. The black line, of course, is the model. The blue dots are the actual observations of the cumulative abundance as you go up in the scale. And you'll see that they're very often stepped. Okay, so it's not a perfect fit to these. It fits actually statistically pretty good, but, but there's a lot of these uh, these jagged steps here. And one of the questions remains is, are those real thresholds or are they just artifacts? We don't know. That's something that should be investigated. But it's important to not only look at the models, but look at the data, because it can give you a lot of information. If those are real thresholds, then um, you're going to have much more rapid change at any particular yield than you would expect from um, what you have in you know, from a model prediction. Uh, so the, uh, one of the bottom lines here is don't shoot yourself in the foot with a model. It is just something to help you with guidance. Uh, the other thing to consider is about gear. What I've shown you were active gear collections, okay? So with regard to, to walleye, it's almost always boat electrofishing. Uh, it could have been trawling or saning. You don't get a lot that way. Uh, if you do the same thing with uh, gill net catches, passive gear, uh, you will get different points of character on where the optimum is, where the maximum change occurs at the low end, etc. And so uh, the gear matters, the system matters, the, the amount of data matters, uh, the effectiveness of sampling in different years, etc. So the models are here for a guide. Um, 
And I'm hopeful that what I've created here with the computer program is going to make life easier for folks who would like to apply this kind of a tool uh, and explore what the changes could be uh, with regard to, to flow and, and walleye. Uh, as you recall from uh, the uh, user interface, we've done it for ground trout, brook trout, uh, walleye, and we do have a sturgeon model. Um, and they vary by uh, different loading season or systems and season where we had the data to do that. Um, so if anyone is interested in having a look at this or playing around with it, I'm very happy to share that with you. Uh, and if you've got any questions at this point, that's all I have. Thank you.